Hello, my name is Jacqueline Pollock, and today I wanted to talk about glissandos on the harp. Um, a gliss is a very common technique. In fact, I would say it's an iconic technique on the harp. And what I wanted to do today is to approach these glisses from a repertoire standpoint. Uh, glisses come up in music all over the place. And so I've selected um, six pieces at a variety of levels, starting with the beginning piece and moving forward all the way up through an advanced piece. And all of these pieces uh, feature glisses within them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of each piece, and then I'll talk about the glisses within them and uh, go over what makes them tricky or not so tricky, <laughs> and also talk about a few uh, different practice approaches and tips and tricks for playing them. Now, a gliss is uh, fairly easy to play on the harp because all you have to do is run your fingers along the strings. But a lot of times what makes it difficult are some of the different ways that it's incorporated within the music or some of the details surrounding it. So if you don't know much about glisses or you've never played one before, um, I have a whole separate video that approaches glisses just from a purely technical standpoint. So not looking at any music, but just going over all of the ways that you play them on the strings. But as I said in this video, we're really going to focus in on these six pieces that all feature glisses. Let's start with the Purple Bamboo, uh, which is a Chinese folk song, and it was arranged for the harp by Samuel Milligan and comes from his book, Fun from the First, Volume 2. This is a beginning level piece, and it's playable on a lever harp. And throughout the piece, there are several glissandos, so I think this piece is an excellent choice for an introductory piece uh, with glisses. Now Milligan has it notated that for the glisses, you should have a B sharp and an E sharp. Um, and if your lever harp is tuned in the key of C, you can do that easily enough. But if you have it tuned in the key of E flat, like many people do, um, then you can't do that. And it would be perfectly fine to just leave your harp in the key of C. All of the techniques would be the same. Uh, but since I'm playing this on my pedal harp, I'll go ahead and do the B sharp and E sharp throughout. So there are two different types of glisses in this. One is just a simple ascending gliss. And um, I think the great thing about that is that you've got plenty of time to think about making your starting and ending pitches really precise. You could do it the way I just did where you keep the whole uh, gliss in one hand, or you could cross over with your left hand to play that top pitch. Either works quite well. And then at the end of the piece, uh, there are a few continuous glisses um, in the right hand where you're just going down and up and making a long chain. And for many students, this might be the first time that they encounter that. It's definitely trickier than simply doing a, a, a gliss that either ascends or descends and then stops because instead you have to add a turnaround where you flip around at the bottom and top and trying to make that all really nice and smooth uh, can be a bit of a challenge. I like to think about having my um, thumb on the way down come all the way down to the second to the last string and then uh, having the second finger take right over and then doing the opposite at the top. So essentially a really good gliss I think sounds a lot like an extremely fast scale where you can hear every single string, you don't skip anything. Since this is quite a short piece, I'm just going to go ahead and play it in its entirety. So here is the Purple Bamboo. Next, I wanted to look at a piece called Koto in the Temple by Suzanne MacDonald. This comes from volume three of Harp Solos, Graded Recital Pieces, which is a series that MacDonald has with fellow composer Linda Wood. And I would say this piece is written at an early intermediate level. 
Uh, it's playable only on a pedal harp. And you'll hear that it has quite a similar sound to the purple bamboo. Um, that's because both pieces use a pentatonic scale for the glissandos. Uh, in terms of glissando development, I think this is a great uh, sort of next step. There is a long section in the piece where the left hand is playing the melody, and then the right hand is accompanying that with continuous glisses. Um, what a lot of people find challenging about this is the alignment between the two hands. And that's a bit tricky because the left hand is playing um, uh, very rhythmically. And then a lot of people find that their right hand just sort of wants to mirror that rather than keeping a nice steady uh, glissando behind that. So um, I think a thing to do if you're having that trouble where your hands are not lining up properly is to try and figure out if your right hand is trying to go too fast or too slow, or maybe your right hand just wants to change directions every time your left hand plays a note. Uh, whatever your tendency is, <laughs> I would figure it out and then sort of try and slowly nudge it uh, the correct direction from there. Another big challenge to this is um, keeping uh, an eye on the length of gliss in your right hand. So McDonald leaves her gliss notation a little bit open in this in terms of where to turn around at the bottom, where the bottom point of your glissando is. But there's um, a very practical consideration, which is that your left hand is quite close. So you want to make sure as you're playing that your, your gliss doesn't dip down into the left hand uh, strings. Like there, <laughs> you have an undesirable overlap. So uh, I think this is a, a great piece to work on uh, sort of these various coordination things in terms of gliss development. I'm going to play a passage from the middle of Koto in the Temple, uh, where this glissando section begins. <laughs> called Great Day by Nancy Gustafson. This comes from a book of hers called Sparklers, and all the pieces in the book feature glisses in one way or another. So if you're looking for a lot of glissando practice, uh, this is a great book for that. And this is an intermediate level piece. Uh, it's playable only on a pedal harp, and there are glisses throughout this entire piece, uh, a few different kinds. Um, at the beginning of the piece, the left hand are playing uh, glisses in a form known as gushing chords, where you play a very uh, short and rhythmic glissando, um, and that is in the accompaniment like this. Uh, then later in the piece, she has these long um, sort of chains of glisses with the hands trading off. And even further on, she has more uh, very rhythmic glisses uh, in sections like this. So I think this is a great piece to really focus in on glisses, and I love that there are so many different kinds of glisses throughout this piece. Uh, two things that I think it's particularly helpful for working on are working on having your glisses be um, very rhythmic and kind of percussive in a lot of these ways. Uh, thinking of them that way rather than just an accompaniment or an effect, I think is an important step in um, being really versatile with glisses. And the other thing that I think is great is that uh, both hands are playing a lot of glisses and frequently they're trading off. Uh, she has that notated in the music. Um, but that can just be a, a lot to keep track of which hand you're starting with and when you're switching to the other one. So it's a really good practice for working on all of that. So I'm going to jump around and play a couple of different passages. I'll start at the beginning um, and do the opening section with the, the left hand playing glisses as gushing chords. And then I will jump to the middle 
and do the end of the section with a lot of long glisses and then that leads right into the next section the beginning of the next section with these very short uh, different rhythmic glisses um, another layer that Gustafsson adds to all of these glisses are um, petal changes there are quite a few uh, and generally they happen uh, just in between glisses so that you finish with one type of gliss and then you change your petal and change the sound for the next gliss so this is also a great practice for that. So here's Great Day, a few passages from it. Salzado loved glisses and they're all over the place in his music so it was really hard to choose just one piece of his to look at for this video uh, but I thought that we would take a look at rumba which comes from his suite of eight dances and in the final section of rumba um, he uses gushing chords for the melody so these little short percussive glisses <laughs> Um, I think this is a really a fun use of glisses. Uh, it's great. And there are a few different things to think about. Um, one is trading off between the hands and then the direction of the gliss, whether it's ascending or descending, and he has all of that marked. Um, he also has some fingering marked. So when you're doing the really quick glisses, you're actually alternating fingers between your third finger and your second finger. Um, and that can be a little bit tricky to get that down and have a nice um, matching sort of pair of glisses so that you cannot hear the difference in fingers. And then another thing that some people find tricky is that in addition to all of those types of coordination things to think about, you also have to be um, fairly precise with where you're placing these glisses on the strings. So the um, glisses in the right hand, these little tiny short ascending glisses, he has notated to be just below middle C. And then you want to make sure that your left hand is jumping up to the A above middle C for the descending glisses, so you really keep the contour of the melody within these glisses. I'm going to go ahead and play this final section of rumba featuring all of these gushing chords. And um, I don't think I mentioned it yet, but rumba is written at sort of a late intermediate or early advanced level, and it's playable only on a pedal harp. <laughs> Another composer who loved glisses was Maurice Ravel, and I thought that now we'd take a look at Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe Suite No. 2. So this is an orchestral excerpt rather than a solo piece. And Ravel actually uses uh, two harps in this, and um, there are many glisses <laughs> throughout this part for these two harps. Um, and unlike the rumba that we just looked at, where the glisses were very percussive and very melodic, here the glisses are decidedly accompanimental. Um, I think in a lot of cases in this part, they're providing sort of a wash of so sound behind the melody. Um, so there are a lot of continuous glisses. And I think um, some of the big challenges come in making everything really even, both in terms of sound and in terms of speed, so that you have a really stable backdrop um, for the other instruments in this piece. Um, so a lot of that comes from having good control, making sure that nothing kind of rushes ahead or drags and then catches up. Um, and also thinking about some of those same things we were talking about earlier, about having every um, string played and then leading right to where it flips around. 
Uh, and then this is kind of um, made even more difficult by the fact that frequently the two harps are trading off on these glisses. So you'll be glissing along and then you'll have to hand off the last gliss to the other harpist. Uh, sort of similar to being in a relay, <laughs> I think. Um, and Ravel does a lot of this quite cleverly. Sometimes he's using the trade-off um, to give one harpist a chance to have a rest, move all of their pedals, and then jump back in with a gliss with different pedals. Uh, sometimes I think he's just giving um, a harpist a little break, a chance to catch their breath. And at other points throughout the part, he has the harpists glissing in opposite directions, so you get um, even more layers to the glissando. So I think it is all very well done and excellent use of glisses. Now I'll play a passage from the middle of Daphnis and Chloe. And every time I have a rest, that is where the other harp would jump in and continue the glisses to create uh, the overall effect of this very long uh, stream of continuous glisses. And on most of those rests, I'll have uh, quite a few pedal changes to make before I jump back in. today, I wanted to look at Benjamin Britten's interlude from A Ceremony of Carols. Uh, this is a really famous piece. A Ceremony of Carols is written for a harp and women's chorus. And then in the middle of the larger work, there is a harp solo, the interlude. Um, it's an advanced level piece playable on a pedal harp. And throughout it, there are many harmonics, which is what it's known for. Um, and in the last line, the last section of the piece, uh, Britton also adds these continuous glissandi. Um, so this is really a tricky passage for a couple of reasons. One is that these glisses need to be really slow and really controlled. And then secondly, the way that they fit in rhythmically is quite complex. So what would have been easier <laughs> is if he'd written it, there's this uh, melody and harmonics in the left hand. And if he'd written it so that the glisses um, changed direction, directions with the harmonics, uh, that would have made it substantially easier like this. But instead, you have to keep changing directions in between the harmonics and in these very precise um, rhythmic spots. and so on. So in practicing this, um, I think the first thing to focus on is that really slow glissando. Uh, to me, it feels really restrained, like I'm really holding back as I'm playing and never letting my hand kind of push ahead. And then as far as lining everything up rhythmically, I think a great way to practice it would be to just um, practice one gliss at a time. So for example, you could play the first two harmonics and the way the gliss works for that one is that it starts just after the first harmonic and then ends with the second harmonic. So you could just do that much a couple of times and then add on this um, second gliss, which comes back down and ends just after the third harmonic. So you could just keep practicing this way, sort of adding on a gliss at a time and seeing if uh, where you end the gliss lines up uh, rhythmically exactly where you want it to. I'm going to go ahead and play this last line from Britain's interlude. I hope this video has given you some ideas about repertoire involving glisses in a variety of situations. 
And because glisses are such an idiomatic feature of the harp, uh, there is plenty more repertoire out there that involves uh, glisses of all different kinds. So um, good luck to you with your glisses.